I want to talk to you today about the Jesus way to emotional freedom. We started talking a few weeks ago about the Jesus way to promotion. It's through humility. The Jesus way to your destiny. It's through humility. The Jesus way to emotional freedom. I I shared with you yesterday or last Sunday, I think seven, seven simple steps to emotional healing and health. And I want to pick up there and talk about the Jesus way to emotional freedom, the emotional freedom. uh, It's a really powerful word and it's a powerful thought because we need to realize that it's not a sin to have feelings and emotions. It's not a sin. We don't have to run away from God because we have had negative feelings or emotions. We all have felt like hurting ourselves at one time or another. We've all felt what depression is like, maybe not to the same degree as others, but we've all felt anger. We've all felt depression. We've all felt uh, fear. We've all felt anxiety. But Jesus has a way of dealing with these emotions. And frankly, we all have felt like hurting somebody else when they have hurt us and when they have wronged us. They asked Ruth Graham, the the late great wife of the late great Billy Graham, in all your years of marriage, they asked her in all your years of marriage, Mrs. Graham, did you ever feel like divorcing your husband? She looked at them and said, divorce? No. Murder? Yes. (laughs) We all have feelings. We all have emotions. We know Jesus in Hebrews four, verse 15. I want to read this scripture to you. Hebrews chapter four, verse 15. We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Now, you think about that for a moment, that Jesus was tempted in every way like we are yet without sin. The only difference between him and us is he was tempted and did not sin. We've been tempted and did sin sometimes. But Jesus wants to show us the way of dealing with our emotions and having emotional freedom, because I think we all face it. We all deal with it. I know we do. And the reason why people make bad decisions is because of their soul sickness, emotionally sick people or emotionally imbalanced people make imbalanced decisions and imbalanced choices and bad choices produce a bad life. And so what we want to do is we want to get to the place where we we are not ruled by our emotions, where we're not making our decisions based on our emotions, where we're not choosing things based on our emotions. I want you to see this verse in the King James Bible, because I think it it, kind of captures the essence of Jesus a little bit, a a, a little bit more accurately. He says, for we not we do not have a high priest who cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Now, notice what he says. He says our high priest, Jesus, He can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, of our weaknesses. In other words, he feels what you felt. He has felt what you currently feel. What do you feel right now? Do you feel angry? He's felt that. Do you feel jealous? He's felt that. Do you feel depressed? He's felt that. Do you feel uh, now there are some things obviously that, that cross over to a place of sin, but the Bible does say be angry, yet do not sin. So you can have the emotion of anger without sinning, according to Scripture. So Jesus could have been angry, yet without sin. We know he was yet without sin. So clearly he could experience every human emotion yet without sin. Are you with me? Maybe jealousy is a bad example because it's not really necessarily an emotion, but it's a a belief that somebody has it better than you and you are coveting that so that clearly Jesus was not guilty of that. But he felt everything we feel and he he went through the emotions that every one of us go through. He yet he was without sin, yet without sin. That's his divinity. Tempt feeling touched with our feelings. That's his humanity without sin. That's his divinity. We have to understand that about Jesus. He was tempted with lust. He was tempted with fear. He was tempted with anger. He was tempted with depression. Yes, he had all of these feelings and all these emotions that you've been tempted with yet 
without sin. But as a result of him feeling these things, he can understand what you're going through today. He says, I know I've been tempted with you with what you're being tempted with. I felt what you're feeling right now and I'll get you through it. I'm not mad at you. I'm not upset at you. I'm not surprised. I'm not shocked. I'm not worried. I'm not afraid of you having feelings. I'm not afraid of you having emotions. I just want to show you my way of your emotions not having you. You can have emotions without them having you. You can have feelings without them having you. Are you still with me today? Well, this is this will set you free. God's not mad at you. He's not against you because you've had these feelings. He's not shocked. He doesn't say he doesn't say me, Christ, I can't believe, you know, as opposed to. OK. Oh, my me. <laughs> nothing shocks him. Nothing surprises him because he's experienced everything you've experienced. He's felt everything you felt yet without sin. Now, I want you to see this. He knows the addictions. He knows the strongholds. He knows the opportunities that Satan brings to defeat you. He didn't he wasn't addicted. Understand that. But he knows the he knows the temptation to be. He knows the temptation to give up. He knows the temptation to throw himself off a cliff because that's what Satan tempted him to do. He knows the temptation of quitting and giving up on his calling and giving up on his purpose. He knows the temptation of getting so mad at people that he's going to just release them from their from his from from his from his companionship. But he didn't. He got mad at him at times. He got angry. He was tempted with anger to take over and rule his decisions. But he wasn't ruled by his anger. He wasn't ruled by his emotions. He wasn't ruled by his feelings. Thank God we have a savior like that. So let me show you something. Let's go over to Mark, Chapter 14, and let's look at Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane to, to, to learn the Jesus way. To emotional freedom. Anybody interested? Now, let me tell you something. Jesus feeling what we felt makes me love him more. Jesus being tempted with every temptation I've ever been tempted with makes me love him more because now we have a high priest who's been touched by our feelings and has felt what we felt. And therefore, he sympathizes. He values. He understands. And I think that's probably the biggest thing right there. I think if you've ever been in a relationship with somebody who just refuses to understand what you've gone through or can't understand what you've gone through or can't at least appreciate that they can't understand it. You know, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, in the topics, well, in, a, in you know, with the hot one of the hot topics in our in our country today of racism. No one can truly no one who hasn't had racist treatment towards them can understand what's that like, what that's like. But what we can do is we can admit that we don't understand and have sympathy and empathy. You can't necessarily uh, say, oh, I know what you're going through. You just got to get over it. You can't do that because that shows a lack of empathy. You know, I think what we need in our country and in our world today is just empathy. If we had empathy, that means the ability to appreciate what somebody else feels and the ability to feel some sort of compassion and some sort of an effort to understand. That's empathy. OK, it doesn't mean that you can say, oh, you know what they're going through, but you can have empathy and say, man, I don't know what you're going through, but I'm there for you. I can't possibly imagine what this is like if you've been sexually abused and I haven't been, but I am standing with you and every feeling you have as a result of it is fair. Every feeling you have to want to retaliate is fair. I just want to show you a way not to retaliate without making you feel shame for wanting to retaliate. 
You see, God doesn't want us to feel shame for the feelings we've had, for the emotions we've had. We shouldn't feel ashamed that we felt a certain way. We just need to find the Jesus way of having emotional freedom from that shame, from that retaliation, from that anger, from that fear, from that depression, from that sadness, from that sorrow. Who's with me here today? Still look, look, look over. Look over with me in Mark 14, 32 and look at what it says. So Jesus went to a place and uh, they went to a place called Gethsemane. And I'll get to that in a moment. And he said to his disciples, sit down here while I pray. Now, we'll come back to that as well. But I want you to understand there's a reason why Jesus took them to Gethsemane. And if you've ever been to Israel or you've studied it at all, Gethsemane is where the olive oil, where the olives are. This Gethsemane is full of olive trees and it's where they would press and squeeze the olive to produce olive oil. And if I can give you a little a little insight into Gethsemane, Jesus was on his way to the cross and all the pressure of hell was against him. Gethsemane is described as the place where the olives were crushed. They would crush and press and release the oil. Jesus is in a moment of his life called Gethsemane, where he's being pressed on every side emotionally. It is the place of crushing the olive, squeezing it, pressuring it so oil can be released. We feel pressure sometimes on every side. We feel pressure emotionally. We feel pressure in our finances. We feel pressure in our relationships. We feel pressure in maybe in, in dealing with some sort of sickness, some sort of temptation. It's OK. Jesus has been there and Jesus is going to show you the way through these times of great pressure and stress. And we're going to see it right now before you walk out of the doors of this church today. You're going to discover the Jesus way to emotional freedom. But the, but 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 I need you to understand this. You might be going through your own Gethsemane. Now, you're not going to die on the cross. You're not bearing the burden of the sins of the world, but you have your own burden that you're bearing. You have your own cross that you're dealing with. You have your own pressure that is mounting and squeezing you and creating stress in your life. And Jesus shows us the steps. Yes, the steps, the simple steps to having and discovering this emotional freedom. But I want you to see here a little bit more about Gethsemane. It means the oil press. Another word for this word Gethsemane is the press of the eighth. For those of you that are into biblical numerology, you know that the number eight represents a new beginning. It represents starting over. So Jesus is about to go to the cross so each one of us can have a new beginning and be born again through his death and resurrection. We can have the press of the eights. He's going through this sacrifice. He's going through this pressure to then eventually go to the cross. And there we experience new life and a new beginning. But I want you to understand something. This this also means that this symbolizes this eighth day symbolizes a new beginning in your life. So I want you to know that if you're going through emotional pressure right now, stress of any kind, I'm telling you, as you take these steps that God's about to show us in his word, as you take these steps, you're about to be released into a new beginning. You're about to be released into something fresh. You're about to be released into something new, because when that oil from those olives got produced, you know what the oil produced it it produced it would it would produce light. The oil would produce healing. The oil would produce the anointing. The oil would produce it would speed up the process of healing. It, 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 it made the skin better. It made the wounds better. It represented the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And what I'm trying to say to you is whatever you're going through right now on the other side of this, if you don't quit on the other side of this, if you don't give up on the other side of this, if you take these simple steps that I'm about to lay out the Jesus way to emotional freedom, you are going to release new light in your life from the oil that's going to come forth. You're going to release new anointing in your life from the oil that's going to come forth. You're going to experience new, fresh discoveries and a new, fresh beginning to whatever the season of life that you are in. It is about to get better. Don't run. Don't quit. Don't give up when you're pressed on every side. Follow the Jesus way. You're going to feel like giving up, but I'm just telling you, that's OK. I like I like when I feel like giving up. It's a great feeling. I've given myself permission to feel like quitting. I just haven't given my permission myself permission to quit. 
But I've given myself permission to feel like, man, I feel like quitting. You say, well, why don't you? Because I hadn't given myself permission to, to, to do that. I give myself permission to feel it. But that's up to me. I've given myself permission to feel it. You say, oh, isn't that tempting? No, it's me giving myself some room to breathe. Anybody ever feel like giving up? Like, stop pretending like you didn't stop acting so holy that we can't relate to you all, Jesus. Even Jesus, who never gave up, felt like it. Prove it, Pastor. Where is that in the Bible? In the very next verse. Verse 33. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be struck with terror and amazement and deeply troubled and depressed. And depressed. Afraid. Jesus. Yeah. Yet without sin. But he felt everything you feel. Deeply troubled. Don't you don't you think of some people you don't want to be around and you're like they're deeply troubled. <laughs> Depressed. Wow. This is amazing that Jesus felt these things yet without sin. So here's what I want to tell you. There is no shame in whatever you're dealing with right now. There is no shame if you're going through depression. There's no shame if you're dealing with an addiction. I'm not saying Jesus was. I'm just including that in the fact that there's no shame in it. He was de- he was in a moment of depression, according to the Bible. Terror, which is fear. He began to be struck with these things. They didn't. They didn't make his decision for him, but he felt these things. It's OK to feel it's OK. You're OK. You are not your problem. You are not your emotions. You have emotions, but you are not your emotions. You have crazy thoughts, but you're not crazy. Am I right? Well, I don't know. I can't speak for all of you, all, but. <laughs> Let me show you something very powerful. So look. In verse 33, he began to be struck with terror, amazement, deeply troubled and depressed. Amazement is the word shock, fear, deep trouble and depression. It's not something to be ashamed of if you face fear. It's not something to be ashamed of if you've been shocked and like, whoa, where did that come from? Whoa, how did that happen? How did my husband do end up doing that? How did my wife end up there? How did my kid end up on drugs? How did this my boss end up firing me? How did my company end up going bankrupt? I mean, you don't look, there's nothing wrong with being in shock. Like, whoa, I'm, that kind of that really shocked me. That really caught me by surprise. I can't I don't understand that. It's OK. God just doesn't want you to stay there. It's OK to have sorrow and sadness and grief. We've been told religion has told us you better never be sad. I'm sorry, too late. Just you saying that made me sadder. You should never be depressed. As soon as somebody says you should never be depressed, I'm ready for a handkerchief. Because that's like demoralizing. You should never feel like what you felt for years. You should never feel like what you're feeling right now. It's it's it, 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 people put shame on you in the name of religion. Oh, you should be better. You should have more faith. And I'm going to show you Jesus had faith, but he's honest. He's real. And I love him more because of it. I love him more because of it. What if it what if we would have had a savior that was never tempted? then he could not sympathize. He would not have been able to empathize with what we go through unless he was tempted in all things as we are. It would be hard to love a perfect man who never even felt what we felt. But it's easy to love a perfect man who felt everything we felt, but found a way through it and then shows us the way. 
So what happens? The first thing he does is in verse 32. He goes go back to verse 32. He says, sit here while I pray. He's not expecting anybody else to do his praying for him. The first step to emotional freedom that Jesus took, the Jesus way to emotional freedom is go to God, go to God. When you're struck with terror, go to God. When you're struck with fear, go to God. When you're struck with amazement, go to God. When you're struck with depression, go to God. When you're struck with bewilderment, go to God. When you feel in shock, go to God. When you're not sure what to do, go to God. When you feel like giving up, go to God. When you can't stand the pressure, go to God. Sit here while I pray. He doesn't put out a Facebook post and say, will everybody pray for me? Will all my friends pray for me? And if you really believe in prayer, you got to at least reply and share this and then nobody shares it. And you're like, I don't have any friends. That's the best thing you learned all day. You don't have any friends on Facebook. They are not your friends because they're on Facebook. They are not your friends because they follow your little cute pictures on Instagram. They are not your friends because they follow your story. You're not looking for friends that will just push a button to do something to prove to you that you've got a friend. Oh, no. Let me tell you something. Jesus didn't say, hey, guys, I'm really struggling. Would you pray for me. Jesus went to God. He's like, just sit down. Don't even mess with me. Don't even look. You guys just sit there. You'll mess it up. I don't want to want you guys praying. You'll screw it up. I love you. And then you're my disciples, but you'll screw this up. I'm going to pray. We can't delegate our praying to somebody else. We can't delegate our relationship with God to somebody else. You sit down here while I pray. It's personal responsibility to go to God. Oh, pastor, would you go to God for me? No. <laughs> what kind of pastor would not go to God for me? Because the, this kind of pastor, I'm not going to God for you. I'll go to God with you. But I'm not going for you because I'm not your priest. Jesus will go for you, but you got to at least go to him. <laughs> like You got to pick go to Jesus or go to the father or go to the Holy Spirit. You got three choices, multiple choice. They're all good. All of the above is good, too. <laughs> But you can't delegate your personal relationship with God. Sit down here while I pray. Well, is hasn't he disqualified himself from praying because he's depressed? No, if you're depressed, pray. The Bible says, is anyone sorrowful among you? Let him pray. Is anybody discouraged? Let him pray. Let him sing. Look at James five. Not right now, but go look at James five. Look at James five. Everybody's going, Okay, I wish you would. I wish you would open your Bible. It'll help you. But go look at James five someday, like later today. Not someday, I mean Sunday. (laughs) You guys sit down while I go to God. This is not the savior's way. This is not the savior Jesus way. This is the man Jesus way. This is Jesus, the man, not Jesus, the savior. He is Jesus, the savior. But here he is Jesus, the man, so that you have an example to follow. What can you do when you're struck? When you're sorrowful, can you do this? Can you go to God? Yes, because the Bible says his throne of grace is open at all times for you to go to him and receive mercy and find grace to help in your time of need. Go to God. Number two, number two, he says in verse thirty two or verse thirty three, and he took with him Peter and James and John. What is the point of this verse? The point of this verse is that he's not delegating prayer to them but he is choosing wisely his associations. The second step to your emotional freedom is you got to surround yourself with the right people, not perfect people, just the right people for you. What kind of people? I think I might have time to show you this. What kind of people should we surround ourselves with? I'm going to show you real quick Um, because I can tell you, don't don't surround yourself with negative people. Don't surround yourself with with um, with with people with chronic negativity and complaining. But 
in uh, first Samuel chapter 10. Uh, let me read this to you real quick. First Samuel chapter 10. If you look at um, if you look at verse three, it says, and this shall be a sign. Uh, this shall be a sign to you that the Lord has anointed you to the to be prince over his inheritance. When you depart from me today, you will meet two men by Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin, and they will say to you what you've been looking for has been found. And then you shall go on from there further. So look at what they're carrying. You'll meet two men that say to you, look, that what you've been looking for has been found. And then he says, then you shall go on further and come to the Oak of Tabor. Three men going up to God will meet you there. So who should you surround yourself with? People that are going up to God, people that are going up, people that are going up. You want to know who to surround yourself with? Not people that have never fallen, not people that have never made a mistake, but surround yourself with people that are going up. Surround yourself with people that are going forward. Surround yourself with people that are going to God. Surround yourself with people that also go to God when they're in their tough time. They're also going to God in their t And what kind of people are they? They go to God. And what else? Look at what they're carrying. Three young goats, three loaves of bread and a jug of wine. Now you could say, man, that jug of wine that just put me over the edge. That's not the kind of person I need to be around a guy with a jug of wine. But you know what? You may come to a point in your life where you could use a sip out of that. And all I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> you're not leaving Alonzo, are you? <laughs> I know I pushed you, brother, but I don't think I pushed you that far. <laughs> what is this talking about? This is talking about covenant people, a goat, bread and wine, an animal sacrifice, bread and wine. What does this speak of covenant? A covenant is enacted through the body and blood of Jesus. This is a prophetic picture of these are the kinds of people to surround yourself with covenant people, people that are trusting in the blood, people that are trusting in the covenant, people that believe in the sacrifice of Jesus, people that are not whiners and complainers, but people that are trusting God and they're they're carrying the, the, the lamb, they're carrying the bread, they're carrying the wine. In other words, they are carrying their covenant carriers. They're people that carry the covenant everywhere they go. When they run into sickness, they say, I got a covenant with God. They're carrying that covenant when they run into fear. I got a covenant with God. God, when they run into worry, I got a covenant with God. We are covenant carriers. And those are the kinds of people to surround yourself with. Just because someone's saved doesn't mean they know how to carry the covenant. They don't know how to carry the bread or carry the wine or carry the lamb. We need to be around people that know how to carry the covenant. When you go into a situation, you are surrounding yourself with people that know how to stand on the word, that know that the blood is more powerful. They know that no weapon formed against them will prosper. That's who you surround yourself with. People that are going up, going forward. He says, go forward and go to these men that are going up to God. That's just to show you who to surround yourself with. What if they're going backwards? Uh, uh no way, no how. You can try to tell them, don't go backwards, keep going forward. Just don't go with them. You can encourage them. You can pray for them. Just don't go with them. And look at what it says in verse. Go back to verse 34 of uh, Mark 14. And Jesus said, my soul is exceedingly sad, overwhelmed with grief. Have you ever felt overwhelmed? So did Jesus. Have you ever had grief? So did Jesus. How much did he have so that it almost kills me? He's not he's not using a figure of speech here. Jesus is the Jesus speaks the truth. It's not a figure of speech. This grief almost killed him. It almost did kill him. It's about to. But not until he says so. It's about to kill him. But not until it's the right time. On the cross. Not here. This is where he rules his emotions. This is where he discovers emotional freedom. This is where he shows us the Jesus way. So what does he do? He's honest about how he feels. The first step 
that they teach in rec any recovery class is you got to be you, you got to admit it. You got to you got to get out of denial. You got to stop saying, no, 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 I'm not dealing with that. Jesus is not afraid to admit my soul is sad, overwhelmed with grief so that it almost kills me. Remain here and keep awake and keep watching. Now, we know they fell right to sleep. Jesus, I thought you said you got to surround yourself with people that are going forward, but people get tired, too. We didn't say they had to be perfect. And people aren't going to do it all right all the time because neither are you, neither am I. So yeah, they fell asleep, but they, they, they meant well. They didn't mean to fall. Don't get mad at people. Well, wake up. What the, what the heck is wrong with you? I thought you were my people that were I could stand with and would stand with me. Look, you, you, you surround yourself with the right people. You just don't depend on them. Don't put your trust in them. Remain here and keep awake and watching. And they fell asleep. <laughs> verse thirty five. Look at verse thirty five. And he went forward a little. OK, here's the next step. And he went forward a little. He's overwhelmed with grief. What does he do? He goes forward. How much? You don't have to go the marathon. You don't have to run the 5K today. Just go forward a little. God wants you to know there's power in the little. A little in the right direction. Will get you to God's ultimate purpose for your life. A little at a time. You know, one thing I've learned about myself, I've learned about my kids. I learned about like I got a second chance at raising a kid. You know, after raising four, I kind of got a second chance, a new beginning. And the one thing I learned about raising the, the new one, the young one is be patient. Like I thought my kids had to all be, you know, lifting their hands and singing glory to God at four. And they were throwing rocks at each other, you know. And when I confronted them about it, they said, even the rock shall cry out, the Bible says. So they were you know, smarter than me. <laughs> one of them still got a mark in their forehead. I won't say which one, because you got to look real close and. From the rock. So being patient, like God is patient with us. He has. First of all, he waited for you for thousands of years just to be born. He's patient. He sent people across your path and you were like, nah, time to get saved. No, not right now. I'm partying. And he kept sending people across your path. I know that's what he did for me. Until I finally saw his love and I surrendered, he was patient. And then after I got saved, and I'm in all sorts of bad things and like crazy religion and forcing people to live holy or die. I remember telling this group of people I thought I knew what how to study the Bible. I said, look, Jesus said, you know, follow me or, you know, uh, you know, uh, the scripture that said, uh, put your hand to the plow and don't look back or you turn into a pillar of salt. You're not fit for the kingdom of God. I fear for you, child. That's what my form of evangelism was like, like 12 year olds. I was I was 17 or 18. I got saved. I'm talking to 12 year olds. I'm like, hey, look at that. Jesus said, put your hand to the plow, man. I don't see your hand on the plow. You better walk with God. You better serve God. You better not look at a girl. You better not sin. You better not love. You better get rid of that Playboy magazine. You better you better not ever have a temptation. I'm telling you, if you do not surrender all, oh, you're going to hell. Jesus, Lord of all or not Lord at all. Make him Lord now or you're going to hell. <laughs> Thank you. God, I didn't die right then and realize <laughs> how wrong I was. I wasn't even saved. <laughs> Believe in that crap. <laughs> Dear boys from the Ward Presbyterian Church, where I led that Bible study <laughs> and scared the heebie jeebies out of you. Forgive me. God help us all. <laughs> he went forward a little. God is so patient with us. Just move forward a little. That's all you need to do. If all what is that little? Just 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 speak one scripture today in your time of need. 
just pray in tongues for 20 seconds in your time of need. Just lift your hands for a second or two when you're not sure what to do. Just give and plant a seed when you need a harvest. If all you've got is a little, then a little is all you need. And just move forward a little. Maybe come Wednesday when you haven't been coming on Wednesdays, move forward a little. Come next Sunday when you're in every other Sunday -er and come every Sunday, move forward a little. You've been given God a tip at offering time here, Lord, here's a buck fifty. I hope it will work. Give him two. Move forward a little. Now, I'd love for everybody to forgive people and everybody to tithe and everybody to go and share their faith. But how about just handing out a touch card? Move forward a little. I feel like I feel terrible. I feel like crap. But I'm going to share this touch card with somebody. You don't even have to like them. You don't have to be smiling. You don't even have to give it to them. It's like drop it in front of them. Say, oh, yeah, I think you dropped something. <laughs> like be mean about it. Stop littering. Pick up your trash. <laughs> it's moving forward a little. That's very little. <laughs> but <laughs> OK, we're wrapping this up. Look at it. Look at it. Look at it. Is, is the Super Bowl on today or OK, we've got it. We've got a couple more minutes. And his and he fell to the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He fell to the ground. That's worship. That's surrender. Falling to the ground is a symbol of I no longer rely on myself. I'm no longer trusting in myself. I worship. Worship is not just singing a song. When he falls to the ground, it means all that I've trusted in. I am willing to let collapse and I'm going to trust only in the Lord. You can do that. In verse 36, look at what he says. And he says, Abba, Father. So the next step is talking to God as your father. You might be going through the worst time in your life, the worst temptation. You might have blown it beyond compare. He's still your Abba. He's still your father. And you can still go to him as daddy God. And notice what he says. Now his faith is released. Now he activates his faith. All things are possible for you. So we have to use our faith. That's our next step in the Jesus way. The Jesus way, people, the Jesus way to emotional freedom is activate your faith. Father, all things are possible. All things are possible. The word of God is true. No weapon formed against me will prosper. God's promises are yes and amen. Like all things are possible. This is having faith. And then he says, Lord, take this cup from me. That's how he feels. But not what I will, but your will. That's what he chooses. Now, I want you to see this. Lord, take this cup from me. That's how he feels. But not my will, thy will be done. That's what he chooses. You cannot let how you feel determine your choice. You can feel it, but don't let it determine your choice. This is how I feel. Take this cup from me. But this is what I choose. Not my will, but thy will be done. This is how I feel. I don't want to do it, but this is what I choose. Not my will, but thy will be done. This is how I feel like getting back at that person. But this is what I choose. Not my will, but thy will be done. This is how I feel. I want to, I, I, you know, I want to just blow up and hurt somebody. But this is what I choose. Not my will, but thy will be done. This is what I feel. I'm not going to give. I'm not going to trust. I'm not going to sow. I'm not going to plant any seeds. That's how I feel. I feel like the preachers. They just want your money. I feel like the churches just collect offer. I just feel like the churches. They just want this. They just want that for me. They just want this for me. That's how I feel. It's OK. But this is what I choose. I'm going to honor God. I'm going to put him first. I'm going to give. I'm going to tithe. I'm going to offer. This is how I feel. I don't want to go to church, but this is what I choose. Somebody come pick me up. This is how I feel. 
I don't want to serve, but this is what I choose. Where can I sign up and get involved in an entry level way? Because I don't want to, but I know I need to. Not my will, but thy will be done. Let's stand together. This is how I feel. But this is what I choose. You want to have emotional freedom? Go ahead and feel what you want to feel, but don't make your choices based on how you feel. Make your choices based on not my will, but thy will be done.